If you observe the lives of people, you'll discover that many people, probably the majority of people, are unhappy with their current lives. People who are not enough within themselves are always looking for someone or something outside of themselves to do it for them. To give them the happiness, contentment, fulfillment they think that they are missing. In their minds, whatever they are missing, the necessary fix is somewhere out there. The problem's not them, it's something else. If they're married and unhappy, it's their mate's fault. If they're unhappy with their job, it's their employer's fault or the people they work with. If they're unhappy where they live, it's the community's fault. If they're unhappy at church, it's the church's fault. If they don't have any or many friends, it's other people's fault. This assuming that it's always someone else's fault began in the Garden of Eden. Adam said to God, it's the woman you gave me. She's the problem. And then Eve said to God, it was the serpent. In other words, the devil made me do it. People who are not, people are not enough within themselves. And so they're looking for something different, better, and more. They need a new job or a career change. A bigger, better house, or maybe a pool is what they think they need. A nicer car or a truck, maybe a boat. Nothing's necessarily wrong with any of these things, but if you're not enough without them, you'll never be enough with them. If you're unhappy with what you have, you'll likely be unhappy with what you get that you think you want and need. Now think about it. The more you require to be happy, the more happy you will be. When people in life come up short of your expectation, which is far more often than not, then you're unhappy. You'll never for any extended a period of time get everything you want the way you want it. Nobody does. Life is full of letdowns and disappointments. Just ask any character in the Bible, especially Jesus. On the other hand, when you lower your expectations to a sensible reality for a cursed world, where everyone in it is a fallen short sinner, then life can often be better than you require. And every time life is better than you require it to be, you experience the pleasant feelings of happiness. Life is hard. It's what it is, not what we wished it was. And people are who they are, not who we wish they were. So knowing the truth can set you free. But most people don't understand the real cause of their emptiness. So they look for relief in all the wrong places. You'll hear them say, I need to go find myself. This usually means some major change that they'll eventually discover didn't do it for them either. They'll have an affair, leave their mate, and sometimes their kids. They'll change jobs or careers. They'll change churches, thinking, thinking the next one will be heaven on earth. They'll spend money they don't have to buy things they don't need to do something for them that those things will never do. But here's the truth. If you need to find yourself, then you really need to find yourself. The emptiness inside of you and the loneliness and meaninglessness that you have really are real. But what you're thinking about doing to fix it won't. It just won't. You don't need to go and do something stupid in the name of finding yourself. You need to go and do something really smart and find your true self. That's what I want to talk about today is finding your true self. In Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 5, Jesus says, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, denying himself and taking up his cross means I'm not going to do certain things. I'm going to do certain other things. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. If you pursue the life you think you want, you're in danger of missing the life you were made for. But whoever loses his life for my sake gives up on what he thought would do it for him and decides to live for the God who made him, then he'll find it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? In other words, if you win and gain everything, what difference does it make if you never become you? See, you were made to be someone in something. And whatever else you become, if it's not that, it's not of much value. For example, a cell phone. So most of you have your cell phones there with you. And that cell phone, I'll tell you where it came from. It evolved in an apple orchard. Okay, there was an apple orchard, and over millions of years, your phone evolved if you've got an apple product. Got it? Okay? And that, that uh, 
that orchard evolved over millions of years. There was nothing, then there was something, then there was something else, and there was an apple orchard, and out of that apple orchard grew this apple of telephone, right? You say, that is stupid. Who would ever believe that? Well, nobody in their right mind would believe that. But the bottom line is, that's what we think. See, God made you, and uh, he made you for himself, he made you for a reason. And, and you didn't just happen. Behind every thought is a thinker. Behind every design is designer. Behind every created thing is a creator. And that includes you. So you came from some, you didn't just come from somewhere, you came from someone. So God had a dream, that dream was you. And if you never become the you that he dreamed you would be, then you'll never be the you you were supposed to be. And you'll spend your life frustrated because you never become you. What's it profit if you get everything but you never become you? So here's, we're going to talk about finding yourself, opening thoughts. Number one, trying to find yourself is usually about escaping the realities of your life. That's usually what's going on. When somebody says, I want to find myself, what he's saying is, my life is hard. I'm tired of the responsibilities. I'm not happy typically with my marriage or my job or my career. And so I've got to go find myself. And what they really want to do is just escape their reality. A great example of this is King David. David had been warring and had conquered the nations that bordered Israel. His best friend Jonathan had died. He was lonely, isolated, as most powerful people always are, and he was emotionally depleted. He sought to find himself to escape his loss and emptiness through an affair. Before it was all said and done, David had a better man than he was murdered. His mistress got pregnant and lost the baby. And the rest of D David's family life became a nightmare. One son raped his half-sister. The sister's brother killed him for it. That son eventually tried to usurp David's throne, but failed and was killed. What began as a one-night stand instead turned into a painful rest of his life mess. That's what happened with David when he went to find himself. Trying to find yourself is usually about escaping. Number two. Trying to find yourself almost always results in ignoring sound wisdom. In ignoring sound wisdom. In other words, if you would talk to some sensible people, whatever you're about to do, they would tell you not to do it. In Proverbs 18.1, it says, He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. Verse 2, A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. So when most people go to, quote, find themselves, they ignore good advice that people would give them and keep them protected from what they're about to destroy. The third thing is this, opening thoughts. Number three, trying to find yourself almost always results in changing the wrong things. So we want change. We're frustrated with as is. So we go change something. But usually we change something that won't matter. I've, I've discovered this about so many marriages. People who don't do marriage well change things that don't matter. They don't change the things that would matter. In Jot down Acts 17, 21, there it talks about the people in Athens. It says they were always interested in something new, talking about something new, the next thing. See, that's the way some people are. They've got to have something else. No matter what it is now, it'll do it for them for a moment, but now they've got to have something new. They've got to have something different. They've got to have something better. They've got to have something they don't have now. And it's a never-ending search for more. Thinking more will be enough, but more is never enough if you're not enough, personally. So how do you find your true self? Again, if you need to find yourself, you really need to find yourself before you lose yourself and lose the people around you. So here are several things. Number one, finding my true self begins with acknowledging that I'm my biggest problem. I'm my biggest problem. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? We are all good at deceiving, especially ourselves. So we can convince ourselves that wrong is right and right is wrong. I remember a guy years ago, he said that a guy, he believed God, you know, God loves me, so therefore God wants me to be happy. Just, and I'm happy with this girl I'm having the affair with, not with my wife, so God wants me to be with the girl I'm having the affair with. There's a Greek word for that, you know it. Baloney. That's not true. See, that's self-deception. And what we do is we deceive ourselves into thinking that whatever we want is really what not only God wants for us, frankly, we're entitled to it. 
And off we go and do something that may destroy our lives, our families, our kids. And but we just go do it anyway. Well, our hearts are desperately sick. Proverbs 27, 20 says, nor are the eyes of a man ever satisfied. What that means is more will never be enough. New will never be enough. Different will never be enough. There'll always be something else. And she so got to realize that. I, I am basically discontented and I'll always need or think I want more. And if I don't learn to be happy where I am, I won't be happy where I'm going. Because when I get there, I'll need to go someplace else. If I don't learn to be happy with what I have, I won't be happy with what I get because as soon as I get that, I'll need something else. If I'm not happy with who I'm with, then as soon as I get this other person I think I'll be happy with, I'll need to be with somebody else to be happy then. It's always more. Our eyes are never satisfied. Jot down Ecclesiastes 5.10. Ecclesiastes 5.10 is a great verse that says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. Now watch this. If you set your love on anything besides God himself, then nothing else can do it for you. Set your heart on money. It'll never be enough. Set your heart on things. They'll never be enough. Set your heart on some person or people. It'll never be enough. Set your heart on pleasure. It'll never be enough. The only thing that'll satisfy is when you love first and best the one you're made to love first and best, which is God. So I gotta realize my biggest problem is not my mate, it's not my kids, it's not my job, it's not my whatever. My biggest problem is me. On the inside of me is this unhappy, discontented person who keeps thinking it's everybody else's job to fix and make happy. Number two, finding my true self means becoming the person God made me to be. It's not doing something stupid, it's doing something really smart. Becoming who God made you to be. I've got three things under that. If you're around here, they're very familiar. Number one, there's someone I was made to know. John 17, 3 says eternal life is a relationship with God. It's not being forgiven though you are. It's not going to heaven though you do. It's not missing hell though you do. It's having a relationship with the God you were made for. And if you don't have that relationship where it ought to be, no other relationship will ever be enough. Number two, there's someone I was made to be. Romans 8, 28, 9 says that everything that happens in our lives, good and bad, God uses it to make our character like his. Now think about it. Think about Jesus. Jesus comes to save people. He comes to the earth. Those who he came to save rejected him. They beat him to a pulp, literally. They nailed him to a cross. And on the cross, he's praying for God to forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. We read in Hebrews that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. How would you like to be, ha, ha, be able to have joy when somebody's beating the pulp out of you, literally? Well, that's what Jesus has. That's what he wants you to have. He wants you to have joy. See, joy isn't affected by your circumstances. What we pursue is happiness. Happiness means the happenings are going my way. And then because they do, I have pleasant feelings. The problem is things will never always go your way. Frankly, more often than not, they won't. And so you'll never have happiness because it'll always be getting robbed from you. But if you have joy, you can have these feelings of happiness even when you're not getting your way. Even when your marriage is subpar, even when one of your kids is breaking your heart, even when your job is not what you thought it would be, you're very unfulfilled and bored at it or whatever else. Number three, there's something I was made to do. Ephesians 2.10 says that uh, before we were even born, God knew what he wanted us to do with our lives. I've already brought up the Apple telephone. You know, those would make good coasters. So why don't you do that with yours? Why don't you, instead of using it for the internet and communication, et cetera, et cetera, why don't you just go home today, get your little end table there by your chair where you watch TV, and use it as a coaster. Just put your drinks on it. I mean, why bother to use all that high-tech jazz? Just make a coaster out of it. Now you're looking at me and you say, that would be stupid to take something that was meant for so much more than that and just use it for that. Anybody connecting the dots? Isn't it pretty stupid to use your life as a coaster when God made you for something really incredible? And that's what you do when you never become you. You're just a coaster. You weren't made to be a coaster. God had a dream, that was you. Almighty God who created all this said, I want you to be. And I want you to become like me and I want you to do something unique that I've made you to do. You're gonna be different from everybody in the world. 
You have a mission and a purpose. You're not an accident. Which brings us to number three. Finding my true self means realizing that life is his story, not mine. Life is his story, history. It's not mine. Now, we all sit here and go, well, of course it is. Well, we don't live like that. As soon as our mate's not meeting our needs, we think, don't they understand that their sole purpose in life is to make me happy? Our kids aren't doing what we wish them do, to do. Don't they, our children realize that their primary goal in life ought to be to make their father happy? Don't we realize that we're driving down the interstate and there's a lot of traffic that all the cars should park because lo and behold, Rocky is back there and it's all about him, so we should get out of his way, right? You know I'm being facetious. See, we all say, oh, that's silly, but that's how every one of us basically tend to be. It's a church, make me happy. Worship team, make me feel something. It's your job to do for me what I'm not taking time to do for myself. Can I tell you something? If you're enough in yourself, we don't have to do it for you. We're just gravy on, on, the, on, the, on the potatoes. But when you're not doing it for yourself, everywhere you go, you're an umbilical cord looking to hook up to somebody so they can give you what you don't have, what you need, what you're so lonely and desperate for. It's his story, not yours. If you don't figure that out, you're gonna be miserable all your life because life isn't gonna happen around you. Don't all these people know that they're supposed to make me happy? No, they don't, they don't. Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created both in the heavens and on the earth. All things have been created through him and for me. Is that what it says? No, they're created for him. And as soon as you understand that, you don't have to get your way. It doesn't have to be like you wished it was. And frankly, the whole goal of your life is no longer you getting your way, it's making sure he gets his. It's not everybody doing what you want them to do, it's trying to help people do what he wants them to do. Now you're living for something bigger than yourself, which brings us to number four. Finding my true self means having a purpose greater than pleasure and pain avoidance. That's what most people live for, is pleasure and pain avoidance. That would be hard, that would be difficult, that would hurt, that, so I'm gonna avoid all that stuff. Oh, that makes me happy, that gives me pleasure, that makes me laugh, that makes me feel good. I'm gonna pursue all that stuff. If that's all you live for, life will never make sense and you're gonna forever be frustrated because nobody's gonna do it for you all the time. You'll decide that a good husband or a good wife is not good enough. And you'll turn on your kids because they're not doing for you what you think they ought to do for you, which God never made them to do for you. Does this make sense? Romans 8, 28, 29, don't you listen to these verses. They're familiar, but I'm gonna emphasize a part of them. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. Doesn't mean he causes everything, but when stuff happens, God steps in and says, even if it's bad, I'll use it for good. Now, who's he do this for? to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. He doesn't do this for people living for their own purpose. People who are living for pleasure and pain avoidance. He does this for people who are living for his purpose. For those he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. That's a part of his purpose. Romans 12, one and two. I urge you therefore, or brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your, the New American Standard says, your spiritual service of worship. Literally what it means is which is the logical thing to do. The Greek word there is reasonable, and it's really, it's the Greek word logikos. Sound familiar? It's where we get our word logic. If God made you, and one day you're gonna stand before him, the only sensible thing you could ever do with your life is to live for him. It's the only thing that makes any sense. So being a whole, living holy sacrifice is the only logical thing to do with your life. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That you may prove what the will of God is. If you'll do the logical thing and be a living and holy sacrifice for him, you'll know what God's will for your life is and you'll find out, it goes on to say, that it's good, acceptable, it's perfect. Can I tell you what? You can be really happy being you, even if your life stinks for the moment or the season, but you'll never be long-term happy being somebody else that's not you, not becoming the true self. 
I put in your outline, you'll never know God's joy until you're living for something greater than your own happiness. Why? Because nobody else is primarily living all the time for your happiness. Two things under that. Number one, God's purpose for my life keeps me on track when my life is good. Philippians 3, 4, and 8, Paul talks about his wonderful uh, Jewish life. And we might look at it and go, what's the big deal? What it meant is he was a celebrity. He was a superstar in his day among the Jews. You read that in Philippians 3, 4, and 8. Can I tell you something? When you have the right purpose, even when it's all going your way, you don't get off track. Write the word direction out from that. Because God's purpose for you gives you direction. You don't get full of your own head. You don't start believing your own press. You never start thinking you're more than you are. If we can live for God's purpose, it keeps you on track even when life is really good. And then number two, God's purpose for my life keeps me faithful when my life is hard. Sometimes life's gonna really be hard. First Corinthians 6, three to 10, Paul gives a whole litany of it. And he talks about how hard his life was, but did Paul ever give up? Did Paul ever get off track? No, why? Because his purpose wasn't pain avoidance. If it was, he had never done what he did. His purpose wasn't pleasure. His purpose was to please the God he was made for, to live the life God made him for, to become himself, which he did a marvelous job of doing. There's a guy named Viktor Frankl. He was an Austrian uh, medical doctor and a PhD. He uh, it was a psychiatrist, neurologist and psychiatrist, and he's a Holocaust survivor. So get the setting. He lived in the Holocaust. He saw people go to the gas chambers. He saw people brutally beaten and probably raped. And he made some comments. He, he said this. He said, life is never unbearable, never made unbearable by the circumstances, but only by the lack of meaning and purpose. Life is never made unbearable by the circumstances, only by the lack of meaning and purpose. In other words, if you have real meaning in your life and real purpose, the circumstances can't make your life unbearable. They can make it hard, but, but you stay on track. He also said this, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. They can bear with almost any how. Number five, finding my true self requires me to manage my thoughts and emotions. Finding my true self requires me to manage my thoughts and emotions. Think about Elijah. When Elijah was taking care of his soul, his inner life, he stood against the wicked King Ahab and his even more wicked wife Jezebel. On Mount Carmel, Elijah faced down 450 prophets of Baal and oversaw their execution. But when Elijah failed to take good care of his soul, his internal life, he wished he could die. He was clinically depressed, wishing to die. Finding myself usually means that I've lost myself. Instead of living for the purpose for which I was created, to love God best, to glorify Him, to serve God and others, I began to live for far less meaningful things, like pleasure, pain avoidance, self, my own happiness. I get further and further away from being the me I was made to be, the further I get from that true self, the more empty I'm eventually guaranteed to feel. I don't find myself, I lose myself. Another Frankel uh, quote. We who lived in the concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way. Another, the one thing you can't take away from me is the way I choose to respond to what you do to me. The last of one's freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given circumstances. Now, how do you choose, how do you choose to have a right attitude? You gotta take your, manage your thoughts and your emotions. In 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I feel this way. Is that how God wants me to feel? No, then I will not act on how I feel. I think that I'm thinking this way. Is this how God wants me to think? No, then I will not act on what I'm thinking. 
I will say no to that, find out what God thinks, what God wants me to feel, and that's what I will choose. That's what these guys did in concentration camps. In Psalm 50, 15 verses two and five, in verse two it says, he who walks in integrity and speaks truth in his heart, he talks to himself, he doesn't listen to himself. When life goes south, when your life gets hard, when you get disappointed, betrayed, etc., cetera, you're, you're gonna talk to yourself. That's not fair, you've been cheated. You need to get revenge, you should hate that person. All those thoughts are gonna come in. And you gotta take those thoughts captive. And you gotta quit listening to yourself and talk to yourself. No matter how they treat me, Jesus wants to determine how I treat them. I will not let people who, who uh, hate me determine how I behave toward them. I will not give them that power. I will allow God to have that power in my life. This make sense? So you don't talk to, you don't listen to yourself. You talk to yourself, you tell yourself the truth. It goes on in verse five to say, he who does these things will never be shaken. So if, I, if I'm gonna find my true self, I've gotta manage my thoughts and emotions. I want more, but I don't have to have more. And if I get more, it still won't be enough. If I don't learn to let what I have be enough, then whatever I have in the future won't be enough either. That's the truth. That's talking to myself, telling myself the truth. Now, number six. Finding my true life means doing what I should do, not what I feel like doing. Finding my true self, excuse me, means doing what I should do, not what I feel like doing. It means you always do the right thing, especially when someone's done the wrong thing to you. You do the right thing. It says in James 4, 17, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it's sin. Let's give you some examples. Remember Daniel? Daniel's a slave in Babylon and he's been put into this service and they're gonna feed him the king's wine and this unkosher food. And Daniel just makes up his mind. He's gonna do the right thing. He's not gonna drink that wine. He's not gonna eat that food, period. He comes up with a plan that gets him out of it, but he wasn't gonna do it. No matter what they did, he was gonna do the right thing. He had three friends, Shad, Mac, Meshach, and away we go. Okay, wanna make sure you're listening. Abednego. And the king had made a rule that for a certain period of time, everybody's supposed to bow down to this image to the king. And they, just, they knew that was wrong. They're gonna do the right thing. If they don't, they're gonna get thrown in a fiery furnace. Well, they'll just have to go in a fiery furnace because they're gonna do the right thing. And they did. And remember, they went in and got rescued. Later on, there's a law passed that nobody can pray to anybody but the king for a certain period of time. It was a setup to catch Daniel because the men jealous of him knew that he got into his uh, place and opened his window and prayed toward Jerusalem at certain times of the day. And so they set him up and they called him. But Daniel was gonna do the right thing. It didn't matter what they did. They put him in a lion's den for it. But if you remember, God rescued him. You remember Joseph sold by his brothers at the age of 17? He goes down, he's betrayed, he's unjustly sold. He goes to Egypt as a slave, he's sold to a man. The man's wife lies about him, gets him thrown in jail. The jailer forgets him when he was supposed to have helped him. But Joseph did the right thing. He just kept doing the right thing. It says in those passages that God, the Lord was with Joseph. I don't think Joseph knew the Lord was with him. I think he thought the Lord had left him. None of his prayers were getting answered. Don't you know he prayed for justice and deliverance and all the rest? None of that got answered. It seemed God was a million miles away, but he was not. But Joseph kept doing the right thing and 13 years later, he becomes prime minister of Egypt. So my true self, my true self is my most responsible self. When people go find themselves, they usually become their most irresponsible self. John 13, 17, Jesus says, if you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. It's not just enough to know what to do, you gotta do it. Number seven, finding my true self means realizing that all of my problems are opportunities to fulfill God's purpose for me. Finding my true self means that all of my problems are opportunities to fulfill God's purpose for me. Now, watch this. If life is about me, if I'm the center of it, if everything exists to make me happy, am I gonna be happy? Somebody tell me. No chance. More often than not, life is not gonna go the way you wished it did. It just didn't. People aren't gonna do what you thought they ought to do. You're not always gonna get the promotion, the wrong guy is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
But you know what? If you're living for a higher purpose, for God's purpose, none of that's a big deal. You don't have to have your way for things to be good. You just have to make sure you're giving him his way in you. And so what if, what if things go bad? Everything that goes bad is an opportunity for you to fulfill your purpose of knowing the God you're made to know, becoming the person you're made to be, and doing the things you're made to do. So here's Job in heaven. And the devil walks by and God says to him, have you seen Job? And, uh, and, and Job's the richest man on the planet. He's got 10 kids. Everything he touches turns to gold. And the devil says, well, of course he loves you. Look at all he has. And God says, he'd love me if he didn't have this. And the devil took it from him and Job still loved him. And he comes back the next chapter and, and Job's still loving God, even though he's lost his kids, lost his fortune. And the, and the devil says, well, if he, if he lost his health, he wouldn't love you. And so Job loses his health and sure enough, he still loves him. Jot down Job 13, 15. And there he says, though he slay me, I will hope in him. He says, you know what? There's nothing that can make me not love God and follow him. At the end of the book, Joseph, or Job gets all his money back. In fact, doubles it. He gets 10 more kids. It says he dies an old man full of age. What that means is he died an old, happy man. Now, how could he do that having gone through such horrific loss? I'll tell you why. Because Job's purpose in life was bigger than his own personal happiness. It was bigger than pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain. Because he got, he got all kinds of pain. He got no pleasure for a long time. So see, when a problem, if my purpose is to be who God wants me to be, when a problem comes, it just becomes an opportunity. So for example, Acts chapter one, verse eight, I, you, Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses. You're to tell other people about me, who I am, why I made you, what I came to do at the cross. Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. So here's the deal. One of the primary purposes God made you is so you'd be a witness for him. If everything's going my way and I say, I love God, it could be like Job. You can say, well, of course you love God. You got a great marriage, your kids are great, you got all kinds of money, et cetera, et cetera, whatever else somebody would say about a person. And then, but then you say, well, well, what if you didn't have all that? What if you had a life of, full of big problems? Wouldn't that make your life shine brighter? I mean, it's one thing if everything's going your way and you tell me you love Jesus. I'll be glad you did. But I'll tell you what, when your life is a train wreck, and it will be eventually, sometime for some season, and you tell me you love Jesus, I'm impressed. I know you're the real deal now. Who wouldn't love God if everything they touched turned to gold and everything they wanted went their way? But you find out you love God when what you touch doesn't turn to gold and what you want doesn't ever happen. That's when you find out if you really love him. And so whenever a problem comes, it's an opportunity for me to be who God made me to be. I can be a witness for him when I'm at the funeral of my 10 children. I can be a witness to him even though I've gone from the most wealthy man in the world to bankrupt. See, the problem doesn't destroy my purpose. Frankly, it enhances it. It puts a frame around the picture of my life, draw attention to the God who's in the center of it. Philippians 1.20, Paul says, With all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So Paul says, you know what? It's, the important thing is not whether I live or whether I die. The important thing is whether I bring glory to God either way. How do you beat a guy like that? You can't. How do you rob him of his joy? You can't. Philippians, he's on death row and he's writing to free people about how to have happiness, how to have joy. The key word in the book is joy. You see it over and over and over. Joy, rejoice. Wouldn't you like to be like that? Well, you can be if your purpose doesn't require life to go your way. Paul got beaten. He got, uh, you know, all these, he got these liturgies of all the stuff that he went through. But that didn't discourage him. Every one of those problems just became an opportunity for Paul to show what it really means to follow Jesus. And then Romans 5, 3 and 4, we exult, that means rejoice, in tribulations, problems, knowing that tribulations, problems bring about perseverance. When I've got problems, God feels a million miles away sometimes, and I've just got to hang on to him and do the right thing. 
Like Joseph, I don't know when the end of this nightmare is going to happen. I think it will. I had this dream of people bowing down. So I think somewhere, sometime, this will change, but I don't know. So year after year goes by for 13 years, praying for deliverance, no deliverance. Praying for justification, no justification. But he keeps doing the right thing. Would you do that? That's perseverance. And perseverance, what does it lead to? Proving character. That's character. When you do the right thing, even when somebody's done the wrong thing to you. And proving character leads to hope. And the word hope in the New Testament never means wish. You know, we use the word wish. Well, I wish you know, I hope so. The word hope in the New Testament always means a confident expectation. Do so you know what happens? Paul says, when things go hard in my life, I don't get discouraged, I rejoice. You know why? Because it gives me another opportunity just to hang on to Jesus and show him that I love him no matter what. And the result of that is having real genuine character, becoming like the God I was made to become like, becoming me. And when I become me, I have confidence. Kill me if you want to, I'm just going to heaven. You know, maim me if you want to, I'll just be a maimed guy talking about how, much, how good Jesus is. How do you beat a guy like Paul? The answer is, you can't. And that's the kind of person God wants you to be. The real you is becoming that kind of person. Let's wind down. You'll never find yourself running from your problems and your responsibilities. Let's just be honest. How many of you have wanted to run away before? I have. Man, the, the, the responsibilities of church... Broken lives, people's hurts and pains, marriages I've tried to help fix. One time, I, I, I actually, I was going. I decided I'm going to go to Myrtle Beach and just hide out and become one of those wrinkled skin lifeguards and just, you know, vanish and nobody know what happened to me. I got my car, headed out Chapman Highway, past the old steakhouse and thought, well, I bet steak could be good. Went in there and had something to eat, felt better, went home. But anyway, I was headed to Myrtle Beach. True story. I'd had it. Betsy and I were at odds because this marriage we were trying to save, he was playing me and she was playing her. And so we, we ended up in a big argument about, some, about a, somebody else's marriage that we couldn't fix. They eventually divorced. I just wanted to run away. There were the times when the pressures of being a bit pastor, I just wanted to run away and not do this. If you're ever going to be a senior pastor, you better know why you're there. And it better not be because you want everything to go your way and be happy all the time. Because you deal with pain all the time. You deal with loss. You deal with broken people and hurts. But you know what? When you become the real you, you don't run from responsibility. You bear them. You do what you ought to do. You'll never find yourself running from your problems, your responsibilities. You'll only find your true self if you run to the God who made you. The designer knows what makes you tick. He knows how to fix you where you're broken. He wrote your DNA, your software, your owner's manual. How could you ever possibly know true peace, contentment, joy, meaning, and fulfillment apart from doing what you were designed and created to do? How can you know real fulfillment being a coaster for a drink? You were made for a relationship with God. You'll never find real lasting peace without knowing him well. You were created to have God's character. If you don't, you'll live with a subconscious disappointment with yourself and who you are. Because you know you were made for more than you're doing, who you're being. And God dreamed you to fulfill some purpose here on earth. If you don't discover and live for that purpose, which by all means involves serving God and others with what he gives you, then you'll have a gnawing discontent no matter what else you do or accomplish. You'll wrongly assume that the problem is your current circumstances. It isn't. It's you knowing that you're not doing what you're made to do, you're not being who you're made to be, and you're not really trying that hard to know who you're made to know. That's the problem, it's internal. When you become enough, life will be plenty enough for you. This explains why the richest and most happy people are clearly not the happiest. The richest and most famous people are clearly not the happiest. Their lives are more often characterized by scandals, affairs, breakups, addictions, and suicides. Their children are, more often than not, proverbial train wrecks. In Luke 12, 15, Jesus said that not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. 
And surprisingly, these people that have so what so many think they want, fortune and fame, actually want what most of you already have, a pretty normal life outside the pressure of notoriety. Nearly all of the rich and most famous people eventually go underground to seek private lives. If you think that the story of your life is not his story, then you're gonna be disappointed on a daily basis. The world and other people's lives don't and will never revolve around you. If you think they will, good luck, you're gonna need it. This life will be difficult. Jesus in the Bible promises that. There are no perfect jobs, churches, or lives. Every person, every person will eventually disappoint you in some way There are no perfect families, mates, children, friends, bosses, or pastors. If you're completely enamored with anyone besides Jesus, you're living in la-la land, or you just don't know them well enough, take my word for it, the best people will eventually burst your bubble. A lot of people throw away things that are actually really good, like a good marriage, in search of a fantasy. The shine of the fantasy will eventually wear off and you'll find yourself living in another less than perfect reality. If some people would give up on their la-la land fantasies, then you could really be content with your present reality. I had a friend back years ago who apparently needed to find himself. He was in a good marriage, but not in a good place personally. The problem was him, not it, not her. He found himself a fantasy girl where there was no responsibility. And forbidden fruit always looks like it would be the sweetest. I wrote him a long letter telling him that if he left his wife for this other woman, which he did, that someday whatever wasn't enough in this marriage wouldn't be enough in that marriage either. Like most good advice, it got ignored. Affairs light up the brain like drugs, and in the end, they cost you what you didn't expect to pay like drugs. It was about 10 years later that he told me that I was exactly right. He had a fantasy about marriage and what what a wife could, would, and should do for him. When marriage became what what it always does, not almost always, when marriage became what it always does, far less than a continual mountaintop experience, Then he went in search of another fantasy. 10 years later with the other woman, he had no more than he had with the first wife, probably less. When people go find themselves, they usually lose a lot more than they find. When we know our real purpose, which is to live for God's glory, difficulty and disappointment can't spoil that purpose, only enhance it and frame it for better viewing. When there's something in my life that I can't change, I can always change me. When there's nothing I can do, there's always someone I can be, a godly, God-honoring man or woman in a marriage that isn't optimal, with kids who are difficult, in a job that's mundane, and in whatever else you wanna add to that list. Solomon was a humble young man who asked God for wisdom that he might be a good leader. God gave him that wisdom. As a young man, Solomon was the wisest man in the world. He penned God's book of wisdom, the Proverbs. But somewhere along the way, Solomon lost his way. He set out to find himself and in doing so, lost himself. His plethora of women turned his heart away from the only one who could fill it, God himself. Solomon started well, he ended very poorly. In seeking to find himself, Psalm became so cynical that he said that all of life was vanity, wrote a whole book about it, the book Ecclesiastes. He was filthy rich, the most powerful man on earth, and he had all the woman that he wanted, literally. In Ecclesiastes 2.8, Solomon says that he, and I quote, collected the pleasures of men, many concubines. In verse 10, he adds, and I quote, All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold withhold my heart from any pleasure. If fortune and fame could attain it, Solomon had it. And it was all vanity. If you're not enough without it, you won't be enough with it. If you learn, learn to be happy where you are, you won't be happy where you think you want to go. If you're unhappy with what you have, 
And where you are, you'll be even more unhappy when you get what you think you want and it doesn't do it for you. This is exactly what happened to Solomon. The wise young king became a miserable, cynical old man because he set out to, quote, find himself. If you need to find yourself, then you really do need to find yourself. Your true self, the person God made you to be. If you try to forge a life that's not the one you were made for, then whatever you attain or accomplish, it won't be enough. But if you'll become the you that God made you to be and accept the reality that life is what it is, which is a lot less than you wished it was, and that people are who they are, which is not always who you wish they were, and they act the way they act, which is often not the way you wish they did, then who you are, where you are, and who you're with really can be enough. So I want you to bow with me. I'm gonna close with a prayer. And this is a prayer that I hope that you will verbalize to God. This will end the service. I've gone long this morning, but I hope it's been worth it. Sorry for all the distractions in the middle. Here's that prayer. Father, I acknowledge that you are what I need most And whatever I have, it will never be enough if you don't have me and I don't have you. I choose to be grateful for what I have, knowing that it can be enough if I become enough. I recognize that finding my deepest needs met in knowing you and being me is far more important than what I do, where I am, what I have, and who I'm with. So I choose to love you first and best and to honor you in whatever circumstance I find myself. In Jesus' name, amen.